Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis, the web's talk show about Gnosticism, esotericism, mysticism, the great mystics of history, female saints, and so, 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 so much more. I'm your host, Deacon Jonathan Stewart, and I'm joined by a guest host, uh, Bishop Timothy Mansfield. Hello, Bishop Tim. Hello, John. How you doing? I'm doing pretty good, you know, for the, 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 as I often say, I always want to put an asterisk on that, doing pretty good for life in the Konoma with society uh, crumbling around me. But, you know, besides that, uh, fairly well. Uh, great subject today. Two awesome guests. That's right. Two guests. We got Deacon Angie, Whisk Noel. Did I say your name right? <laughs> and Joanne. I don't know your last name, but you will tell us. <laughs> and the topic is... Uh, female mystics throughout the ages, from ancient to modern. Uh, hello, Deacon Angie, and hello, Joanne. Hello. 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 So, I'm uh, really excited to dive into this topic, really excited to, uh, uh, to do it with uh, Bishop Tim, really excited to speak to both of you, and our audience is excited. They can't wait for me to shut up and hear you folks talk. But first, something that's very important, unfortunately, is we are supported by viewers and listeners like you, the audience, uh, and you can help us keep the show going by going to patreon.com slash Gnostic, donating for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. You can also put a cap on that if you're worried we're going to do a million pieces of media and charge you a million dollars, so you can kind of figure out your budget. Uh, and you can also go to paypal.com slash Gnostic and do one-time uh, donations there. Uh, the other thing, too, is I know that, uh, as I've already alluded to many times, these are difficult and strange uh, times that we live in. It, it, we understand that if you want to help us out, it can't do so with uh, cold hard cash. In that case, just tell people about the show, uh, put it on your social media, email an episode to a friend, like and subscribe on the podcatcher of your choice, like and subscribe on YouTube, leave good comments, leave good reviews. Okay, done. Uh, the, enough of the sizzle, time for the steak. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> Angie, I, I understand that the two folks are, are actually part of a, of a work group uh, about the, uh, female mystics. So wh why did you start this group and, and what is it for? Um, I believe our group started back in 2019. Bishop Tim actually invited me and one other member into the group at that time. And we realized that while we were aware of a lot of female mystics, we had not really spent a lot of time reading what they had said. Um, you know, all of them have a bumper sticker, but we wanted to get more into the meat of what they were, what they were offering. And we learned a lot of great things along the way. And then we invited Joanne into the group as well, which was a fantastic addition. So we're really excited to have her with us too. Wonderful. And uh, Joanne, uh, uh, do you have anything to to add to that? Or do, are you enjoying the group? Uh, were you passionate about terrible. the group? Terrible. Uh, <laughs> I'm a little not bit about enjoying it. the group. No, it's yeah. terrible. No, of course I am. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess uh, what I love about the group is that we have an opportunity to discuss different women throughout um, throughout history and their contribution um, to the field of mysticism. And we get to investigate um, a woman's perspective on mysticism as well, which is um, really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And and why why is it important to to really look at a female mystics in particular? Um, I guess throughout history uh women's voices have been censored um and the ones that haven't been censored that we get to look at now present a very um unique perspective on mysticism so um these women are trying to uh, write for the time that they're in so they're writing within a specific framework um usually catholic and uh, they're investigating what it means to be um, a woman and what it means to be a mystic. So um, it's a woman's perspective on a divine relationship with God and how that translates um, into the wider world they're in. So one thing that we've all noticed within the group is that um, these women are not just writing for women, they're writing for a wider audience. Um, it's just a woman's perspective on mysticism and that union with the divine. Yeah. Do you yeah. feel that perhaps because of 
gender issues because of oppression and patriarchy and what have you that that we're actually losing out on some some amazing teachings experiences uh knowledge from these these great writers these great thinkers these great teachers yeah Absolutely. definitely mm -hmm. yeah go ahead angie yeah. Oh, yeah um to that point one one interesting trend we noticed reading the female mystics mm -hmm. is that the first 100 maybe even 200 pages of their writing was typically incredibly dry mm -hmm. just you know they didn't really say a lot of unique or interesting things and then you get to page 250 300 even 400 and you would find these incredible nuggets in in them that that you weren't expecting and it really you know one time was interesting but then five or six times into it, it really seemed like that's how they were surviving their times, essentially, is that that their writing was written, that that if you didn't put in the time and put in the effort to really get to hear what they're saying, you, would, you wouldn't know. If you read the first hundred pages, you would think nothing of what they wrote. Um, but later on, it's where we typically find the meat in their writings, which I think is really interesting given the consequences to speaking things that were more often than not, quite contrary to church teaching. Right. Yeah. Are there so some, okay. Can I hop in for a sec? Are, <laughs> are there some examples of, uh, amongst the women that you've looked at, are there examples of um, consequences? Um, one person in particular that, that stands out because I spent time in her writing would be Julian of Norwich. Um, she was an anchoress, so she was living essentially wall, walled up um, for... I believe at least 30 years, if not longer. I can't remember the details on how long she was walled up, but she she was in her cell. And during that time was the plague. There was also a lot of um, persecutions for, for speaking outside of church doctrine. And at one point in her writing, she said, I got a revelation from God that looking at other people's sin clouds the the experience of god both for myself and for others hmm. and this is contrary to the church church's teachings and god told me this so i know it is true but the church fathers told me something else and i'm trying to she said i hope that god can relieve my confusion one day hmm. so that was her way of of saying i'm going to say the revelation that was given to me but then almost subtly undercutting herself so that she wouldn't be punished for, for what she was doing. So we see this all the time in female mystic writing where they'll say something very revolutionary, very contrary to church teaching, and then they'll sort of put a slide or a caveat in there to, to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So sort of a, a one-two punch of protection. You make the first couple hundred pages really boring, and then anytime yes. you say something revolutionary, it's, but uh, I'm just a lady. What do I know? Uh, then maybe someone smarter will correct what God told me. Well, what does he know? To raise this whole vibe, right, for the first couple hundred pages of Interior mm -hmm. Castle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, the, the, you folks, uh, the, the group uh, the, the helped us out uh, making the, the question sheet for tonight, uh, which is which is really awesome. But the second question we have on here is, who are you people? <laughs> <laughs> now, was that meant to be the group, or was it meant to, to you know, for, for Deacon Angie and Joanne to talk a little bit about themselves? That I think. Okay, Deacon Angie, who are you? Who am I? Um, well, I'm a minister, uh, a deacon minister at the parish of St. Joseph of Arimathea in Calgary. And uh, I spend most of my time home with two little ones. And when I'm not doing that, I'm reading female mystic work. So that's who I am right now. Fantastic. Joanne, who are you? Wow, that's a bit of an existential question, isn't it? Yeah. Appropriate to female mysticism. Um, <laughs> I am a spark uh, no, so... of the divine cast into human form. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, no, so um, I'm one of the co-leaders of the Holy Sophia Narthex here in Melbourne, Australia. I'm currently doing my undergrad um, in ancient history and archaeology and minoring in religious studies. So I find um, medieval history particularly really fascinating um, and I'm really enjoying looking at female mystics as well 
in the minimal free time that I do have. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So the next question we have on here is why quote unquote female and why quote unquote mystics? Go ahead, Joanne. Oh, okay, sure. Um, so I guess um, within the group, we, did, we were discussing this question and we kind of came to the conclusion that we wanted to develop and look at the more female connection to God. So looking at women um, and their experience, not as a conduit, but as in in divine relationship with God. So as I was mentioning before, that there's an assumption um, that women mystics are only writing for women. And we kind of wanted to see if that was the case or if they were writing for everyone. And it seems in most cases that they are writing for everybody. Um, and that a woman's perspective is applicable to everybody as well. So um, looking how uh, women writing in their own time, how their messages can be applicable for us as well today. And I think mysticism generally transcends um, time and space. So um, that's the part of why mystics. <laughs> Wonderful. And uh, Deacon Angie, do you have anything to add to that? Um. Yeah, it it's been it's been really interesting to to a see how women are are navigating the systems that they're living in, um, because that does have a strong influence on their writing. Um, another thing that's been interesting for me is that they often play with gender much more than we think. So we we understand that, or let me rephrase that. Our understanding of how Christianity is, is gender is very binary. It's, it's sort of the stereotype. And and according to the female mystics, that's absolutely not true. So um, I know for sure Julian of Norwich talked about um, Jesus being our mother and giving birth through his labor on the cross. Uh, there's another saint. Uh, her name is Saint Isabella. Oh, no, it's Mother Juana de la Cruz, sorry, um, Mother Juana de la Cruz, uh, she talks a lot about how Jesus is also our mother. Um, and she also identified as um, being male in the womb and then being changed to female during her birth so that she could mm -hmm. enter a convent. So she was also very uh, gender fluid, actually, and, and people recognized her as gender fluid at the time. So seeing these people that worked in, in different um, contexts. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head if anybody else played with gender the same way. Joanne, do you remember? Playing with gender is the wrong term, but but they had a very fluid understanding of gender and expressed very much in their spirituality and their practice. Yeah, um, no one off the top of my head, but it, um, there is very gendered language um, that mm -hmm. these women are writing with. For example, um, uh, Catherine of Siena. So when she describes the soul, she describes the soul as being a she and describing in very feminine terms. So there is that definite uh, use of gender to um, describe um, different aspects of the divine as well. That's a good reminder. Saint Catherine of Genoa, who um, was a difficult read to put it mildly, uh, but she also talked about the soul being feminine. Mm. Can I, uh, just a following question. Um, mm -hmm. I mean that that sort of playfulness with with gender and using switching genders around to make various rhetorical points that's very reminiscent of early gnostic texts as well mm -hmm. secret john does that quite a lot um so i'm wondering whether yeah do you, do you see a connection between this this mystic tradition that you're reading now and early gnostic tradition because there is there resonances between the two that you've noticed I think what I noticed the most is that they're willing to move with what is revealed to them. Mm -hmm. So they're they're not sticking to to doctrine. So so as a Gnostic, we're encouraged to uh, seek our own gnosis, and these women did that. Um, and and so things didn't fit nicely into the the liturgical box or the rules of what religion was supposed to look like, what worship looked like, or even what Christ looked like. Um, I think the the pursuit of their own experience was incredibly important to all of them, and and so we see that carrying through Gnosti the that spark of Gnosticism happening yeah, in beautiful. the mystics. That's really beautiful. Yeah. Um, 
So you, you already did. Uh, uh, oh wait. Okay. What what is it that you actually do? Like when you get together as <laughs> as a group, what are the actual activities of the group? Go oh, ahead. Silence. It's a secret. <laughs> 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 no, no, no. no. In wait to see what happens. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. So uh, we try and meet monthly uh, when when our schedules all permit. Um, but basically, uh, each of us is discovering or um, looking into the writings of a particular woman. So we have a great long list of women saints and mystics um, that we kind of are working through one by one. Um, and so we meet monthly to discuss the particular person that we're um, working on and we discuss their writings, um, any interesting things that we found. Um, yeah, that's pretty much what we do. Very cool. So, so we kind of already uh, touched on this with, with, with a few examples, but can you talk about some of the sayings that you've researched that, that people might not be aware of? Um, yeah, so, so one... You know, I've sort of mentioned, um, I can never remember her name off the top of my head, uh, Mother Juana de la Cruz. She was somebody that we were just sort of searching around and I happened to, you know, look at the footnote of something and she came up, so she got added to the list. Um, and then the sort of standards that you'd expect, so Mother, um, can somebody please help me with the names I'm forgetting, um, St. Teresa. Um, ones that didn't do their own writing. So that would be uh, St. Catherine of Genoa. She she had a lot of experiences that other people wrote down for her. Um, and even contemporary ones. So right now I'm deep in the throes of Bernadette Roberts, who who isn't a saint, but she's a, a contemplative. She wouldn't describe herself mystic per se, but contemplative. And I'm really enjoying a, a contemporary perspective on, um, you know, uh, mysticism and, and all of these issues. But one thing that we're seeing is that, um, you know, a lot of these people had a profound mystical or, or beyond normal experience, whether they called it mystical or not. And the ones that then spent time contemplating that experience, so St. Julian, um, Bernadette Roberts, St. Teresa, they, they all spent decades in contemplation and they provide a real richness and um, comprehensiveness to, to their writing where people that were more um, inspirational so they would have a vision and then speak on it right away they they had a very unique perspective for the time um, but it didn't have that same richness that you that you'd find in a more contemplative practice so so that's been interesting as well yeah, exactly. Joanne, is there um, some some unknown, underknown, underappreciated female mystics and saints that uh, that you either discover for the group or really appeal to you uh, through this uh, through this group and through this project? Um, so I've only really been looking at Saint Catherine of Siena, who is quite a prominent Catholic saint. Um, her writings are quite profound. Um, just the language that she speaks in. Um, I mentioned previously. Um, that women refer, or in this case, Catherine refers to the soul being feminine and she talks a lot about um, divine union. Um, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, the great Dolly Parton, who is still alive. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, everyone's laughing because they, they know. <laughs> um, so yeah, we all, in our list, we also have um, living saints as well. So uh, Dolly Parton is just a fantastic example for those who don't know. She's a humanitarian. Uh, she spends a lot of time um, working with underprivileged people and using her resources to like build schools for young girls. And she's just amazing. So in a non-morbid way, we're waiting for her to be canonized, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> um, she had a whole bunch of um, nature mysticism experiences when she was a kid as well, I think. So she, like, she genuinely has had, like, direct encounters with the divine. It's, for for a woman with the history that she's, the public history that she's had and the, um, you know, how much people treat, you know, a lot of people treat Dolly as a joke. But then when you start to scratch the surface and look at the life she's actually lived and the experiences she's actually had and all the stuff you're pointing to, Joanne, about, sorry, Let's not turn this into the Dolly Parton show. But <laughs> it's amazing. It's genuinely amazing. 
<laughs> the amount that she shows up in our chat, it, she deserves some some time. Yeah, I think she here. deserves some time in the sun. Yeah, and the, the notes. Sorry, the notes here have a have a clarification. It's uh, the Saint Catherine we're talking about is not the Saint Catherine of the Catherine Wheel, right? Not um, is, is that correct? Not not Catherine of uh, uh, Genoa. Oh, okay. So that was just a, a a fun note for for us in there. But yeah, so we we investigated two Catherines. So there was Catherine of Siena and then Catherine of Genoa as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Um, also, Joanne, uh, Evelyn Underhill, is that mm -hmm. somebody who appeals to you and, and why? Uh, so I didn't personally investigate Evelyn. Um, Jen, the other group member, um, she investigated Evelyn. Um, so Evelyn's a really interesting person. So um, she is living, I think, in the 14th century, 13th, 14th century. Um, and she I'm, was. I'm going to hop in, Joanne. I'm sorry. She's yeah, sure. Go. Uh, yeah, 1875 to 1941. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm thinking of the wrong person then. Margarita. Sorry. <laughs> oh, right. Exactly. Okay. That's who I'm thinking of. Sorry. Um, yeah. So sorry. Not, not sure about Evelyn. Um, Angie, <laughs> did you have anything? Uh, not on Evelyn, but I do know more about Marguerite Perret. Um, Let's go there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so Marguerite Perret, um, she she was not associated with any order. Um, that was really unique at the time. She she we don't know very much about her life, but we do mm -hmm. know in 1310 she was burned at the stake and she was caught up at the time in when the catholic church was trying to separate out the templars um so anybody that didn't fit nicely into an order that the church had had um essentially sanctioned uh you you were for lack of a better term on the chopping block um but she did a lot of writing that that then got suppressed because she was a heretic. Uh, so all of her writings remained in Old French until 1965. And then um, somebody translated from the Old French into French. And then I believe in the 1970s, she was translated into English. So while she is um, profoundly interesting, um, we know, I mean, very little people have, have really, very few scholars have dove into her work and, um, Jen, the other member of our group, likes to, to point out that um, she had a Templar sponsor. I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but he recanted. And so in our group, we call her tougher than a Templar um, because she <laughs> she went, she went, she, you know, she stood on what she what she had to say. And, and her big thing is um, basically, if you are trying to fit me into a box, you're not going to understand anything I have to say. Um, but if you, how did that go? Um, something about quieting your soul and brightening your mind, then then you would be able to mm. relate to her. Um, again, Jen's the, the expert on her, but anybody that, that is interested in diving into a female saint, um, or who's not a saint, but, but a profound female mystic, she would be somebody that I would highly recommend. Oh, I, I, I've never heard of her before. I'm definitely going to, to dive in, so. And, that's part of the main purpose of the group. So people that we know and people that we don't, that they get to be spoken of. And even if it only remained in our small group, at least we would know about her. So it's great that other people would get to spend some time. But yes, please, please read Marguerite Perrette. Yeah, and, and I'm sure, um, and again, a lot of people who are listening and watching this are saying exactly the same thing, right? If you're, chances are, if you're a Talk Gnosis fan, uh, we love you all. And I, and I say uh, nerd affectionately, right? Religious nerd, mystical nerd. They're going to be like, I haven't heard of her. I'm going to go out and get her right now. So, uh, <laughs> so you're, you're achieving this, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the group's goals. Um, finally here, and I, 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 we have a note, Julian of Norwich versus Catherine of Genoa. I don't know what oh. that means, and I'm excited to find out. <laughs> okay, so I touched on this a little bit earlier, but Catherine of Genoa, um, I spent I spent a lot of time reading her, and uh, at, at the end of it, I felt almost dramatized. So, um, you know, she was known as this very fiery character. One thing that she was great at saying was, so she was a layperson, so she never belonged to an order. She was married to a husband that... Um, to put it politely, people considered pretty useless. He did a lot of gambling, a lot of, you know, he, he was a man about town, we'll just put it that way. And 
she, you know, sort of grinned and bared that marriage. Um, thankfully, they didn't spend too much time together, but she had mystical experiences. And um, she would go through these periods of extreme fasting, extreme asceticism, and she talked about the love of God that she received. So that's very inspiring. And and there, she, oh, she also ran a hospital and she was renowned for, for basically taking care of this community for for many years and and her integrity around that was highly renowned um again very admirable and she would say to any anybody that came to her um that there was a friar that was criticizing her for not taking formal vows and she said if if i believe that your habit could increase my love for god by by one minute amount, I would rip it from you and take my orders immediately. But my love for God is greater than than your habit, essentially, is what she said. So yeah. again, very inspirational. She's also known as saying, if you um, die a sinner and end up in hell, that's pretty much your own fault. You should have known God and um, too bad for you. So, so it, <laughs> it's really, very, really very John I vibe. <laughs> <laughs> you know it'd be like pages and pages of, of that was the gist of it really and so i i couldn't really you know i couldn't personally advocate for her to be on a, a gnostic liturgical calendar the same way i could julian of norwich so again she had these amazing experiences which very admirable but as far as like digging into her writing i mean you can if you want to but she wouldn't be my first go-to now, Julian of Norwich, um, she got very ill, um, we think, when she was around 30, and she went into a state of, of fever for for several days. Again, this was during plague times, very similar to now. Um, but she she went through this period of, of revelation during, during the fevers. And when she came out of it, she then went again became an anchorite and then meditated on on her experience for 30 years she did not continue to have divine mystical experiences she just contemplated this one profound experience again for for decades and the writing that she produced from that is is incredibly rich nuanced and sensitive um again she talks about how how when we examine sin there's not a lot of use from that she talks about the motherhood of Jesus, the softness and the love of God. Um, it it really is able to um, encompass so many different varieties of of the human experience in a way that that Catherine of Genoa didn't didn't have much. And so that's why we sort of talk about that um, as sort of Julian of Norwich, not Catherine of Genoa. That's that's where that came from. Okay, excellent. Thank you. So have you folks discovered any trends or themes or commonalities among the women that you've researched? I know that a, a couple have popped up, but I'd be fascinated to hear more. Yeah, so I guess as we mentioned before, throughout history, there's kind of like a a trope of the suppression of the feminine. So even when we were uh, making our list of women to investigate, there there, quite frankly, were not a lot of women that were, that were considered mystics or who had writings that had survived. Um, so, as Angie mentioned before, when we do look at the writings that survive, um, one of the things that we do notice is that their uh, writings are very convoluted or there's two kind of distinct voices that are happening. There's the very mainstream voice that uh, would enable them to not be uh, discovered or not be persecuted and then there's the kind of inner mystical teachings that are kind of disseminated later in the texts. Um, so it kind of points to um, women's voices and women's writings being neglected um, historically speaking, um, especially uh, those whose ideas weren't mainstream. So um, you do get people um, being burned at the stake or their writings being destroyed or them being condemned in some way. Um, but also we do see there's trends of suppression as well. So um, being a woman, having an opinion and putting your opinion out there um, in a in mainstream Catholic context anyway, that usually equals some kind of suppression. So. Um, and I guess one other thing that we've found is that most of the women we're looking at are extraordinary. 
Um, the mm. things that they're saying are incredibly potent, incredibly powerful, and in some cases also revolutionary, I think, as well. Um, the fact that they were able to publish or have their work taken seriously, um, I think that's amazing. And I'm, I'm feeling, yeah, very grateful that we're able to discover um, the voices of these women, even, you know, quite a while after they were living. So, Angie, did you did you have anything else to add? No, it, it's just really, you know, uh, we've mentioned a few times, like, the, like they're not writing for for women they're writing for the spiritual experience and um they they have perspectives that that it it's really valuable to spend time in and unless you you know each of their writings it's typically you know six to eight to ten hours you know to spend time in their books and it's been a really worthwhile experience so yeah i was wondering if um if one of you could speak to Again, a really fascinating thing uh, here in the notes, which is contemplative versus channeler. Yeah, so that that's kind of my hill that I like to die on. <laughs> oh, great! <laughs> Go off, Queen. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, it's been really interesting because the the channeled wisdom, like there's there's always gems that you find in the channeled work. So um, you know, the Catherine of Genoa and the um, Santa Juana de la Cruz, they they were both channels. So Santa Juana de la Cruz, she would channel essentially every Sunday for four to five hours, and people would come and and essentially watch her give her visions. And uh, when she talked about her, she would essentially narrate a story of what she was seeing. So she would be in in heaven with Jesus, and she would then um, deepen her voice to speak on Jesus' behalf. Um, and people took her really, really seriously, and and she was venerated in her community for for you know a couple hundred years after she died. Um, what's interesting is is while she talks about um, again, she's another one that talks about Jesus being a mother um, and and uh, nursing the people that come to to him through the Eucharist. She also has a lot of racist stuff in in her channeling and it, it sort of speaks to that experience of I get the impression when people are channeling they're very much speaking to their moment in time um, yeah. when people are contemplating uh, there seems to be more nuance um, you know Bernadette Roberts she's contemporary so she died in in 2017 I believe um, you know, when you read her work, she had uh, uh, an experience of no self. Um, Bishop Tim knows her story a little bit better than I do, but she had an experience of no self, um, which she then contemplated for several decades afterwards and, and spent years and years wrestling with that experience. And um, she's really not speaking to this moment in time. She's speaking to to church history, to church future, um there there's a nuance and and uh a, you would never describe her as gentle but there but there's sort of a consideration for people at all stages in life um and you really see that contrast between like it's it's almost like channeling is making pronouncements to the here and now where contem contemplative people are are really spending time moving forwards and backwards in time in in their writing um, which is a really neat thing to to see the difference of. Um, and it makes me think a lot about our current society where we have a lot of, for lack of a better phrase, pontificating um, in different mm. places. You know, the social media is a great place to do that. Mm. Um, and then it's there's... a native mode, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and it's almost like, you know, I'm speaking publicly <laughs> in the podcast but but sort of people that that have a loud voice and have a big microphone they're they're recognized in their here and now but the contemplatives they they have an ability to go past that and i i just i don't know i haven't quite fully contemplated what that looks like but um it seems very pertinent to to our present social circumstances i think it's a really i think it's a really subtle and beautiful distinction angie it's really because you can imagine people who lived at the, at the same time as some of these people like like Marguerite Perrette or mm -hmm. or Julian, you know, probably very loud, 
voices, you know, proclaiming from a pulpit what people ought to do and think, and we don't get to remember most of them. Mm -hmm. It's the contemplatives that stay. Can yeah. I can I just ask you, I'd like to kind of circle back on the um the the sort of the power and the stature of some of the women that you're studying. Um mm -hmm. I I think like someone like Hildegard who's right. who's we uh, talked about her yet. Well, gosh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I think I think I like to use the term a, a Hildegard class personality, you know, which <laughs> right. So uh, devoted to reforming the 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 political structures of your country, um, a gifted composer, a contemplative, a theologian, and and a major force in the monastic order that you're part of. Um, well, yeah, like if we didn't. <laughs> Like it's almost like you can't shut that voice down because she's such an enormous powerhouse of, of everything. Um, and to and like Teresa of Avila, who who reformed her entire order um, at the time. Like these these women are like mega powerful women. Um, do you think this? To it makes me think like who are we not? Who have we not heard because mm -hmm. they they didn't have the amount of heft to not be silenced. For sure. It, you know, it kind of goes back to Marguerite Perrette. You know, we don't know about her because her work wasn't, it was suppressed for several hundred years and, and then it's just recently been translated. So we're definitely, um, as a group, trying to find people like that, that, you know, we, like we definitely want to cover the powerhouses again because we know their bumper sticker, but we don't know them. Um, right. So that's been a really wonderful experience to, to dive deeper into their work. But again, we're always kind of keeping an eye open for um, people that that you may only see in a footnote or tangentially that that we haven't heard of their work because because it was hidden or or just wasn't highlighted. So, yeah, there's I feel like there this group could go on for many more years because there's a lot more to discover. Yeah, yeah, I think of uh, uh, somebody else for the suggestion for the list if you haven't covered her as uh, uh, Marjorie or Marguerite uh, Kemp be because I, she's I, on the list. <laughs> oh, good, yeah. I might have this story wrong, but like you know, I think it was just a coincidence. Like somebody found her writing, which was meant to be more personal writing. You know, much, much, much later, and and of course, it, it's incredibly rich and uh, incredibly mystical and incredibly deep. And you know, somebody basically just tripped over it or found it in the back of a cupboard one day. Right? It would have been completely lost if it wasn't for for coincidence. So. We kind of have a soft spot for that in our Gnostic tradition, hey? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yep. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So I, to circle back, and, and this is more just me rambling, but if there's any strands <laughs> that are useful, Deacon Angie and Joanne, please uh, uh, please t talk, answer, answer a question. It's not a question. But I, I find this channeling versus uh, contemplation <laughs> thing very interesting because um, throughout uh, history uh, up to the present day across different cultures. Th there's an idea that women are natural channelers, and this is mm -hmm. tied in with an idea that, that women are passive and receptive, right? Um, so I guess number one is like, is, is some of this channeling uh, uh, connections perhaps uh, reinforcing uh, 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 stereotypes that could be harmful? And um, I guess number two is, is, is more of a thought, but uh, I, I, I'm definitely going to, to steal and use your, your, your content contemplation uh, versus um, uh, channeling uh, framework, Deacon Angie, uh, because I find that fascinating because when you read the words of, of the mystics, not just in Christianity or Gnosticism, when you read about contemplative and mystical experiences, they seem to be outside of time and space often, right? Like then they're, they're often seem to uh, be similar to each other across cultures, where I find channeling is quite specific, right? Like if you give me a text and say, this is a channel text, I could probably give a pretty good guess about when it was written. <laughs> so I guess I should have done that the other way around uh, and had the question at the end, but yes, uh, channeling, <laughs> passive, receptive. You know, <laughs> I would actually argue that it wasn't passive. So for um, Mother Juana de la Cruz, that was an acceptable form of preaching. Mm. Now, Hildegard was was one of those powerhouses that she was essentially the only woman allowed to go out preaching, like out of her convent and preach um, from the 10th century on to, well, present day, right? We'd still, you know, you still don't see women ministers or preachers in the Catholic tradition, um, clearly AJC is different. Um, but no, that it's not 
I wouldn't say that there was channeling out of receptivity. I would actually say it was the allowed form of public speaking. Um, so, so actually very opposite energy to, to what you might think, um, which again is fascinating. Yeah, yeah, amazing, amazing. And, and again, actually, sorry to interrupt, uh, Catherine of Genoa, because she would have these divine revelations, she could then um, essentially, you know, speak, speak to the authorities, speak to the priests, um, speak to people that out, that would be out of her station because, because she led such an extreme ascetic life, people would then give that credence. And so I, I have a bit of a suspicion, and this is just my suspicion, that the channeling was, was used as a mode for, for preaching as opposed to like, yes, they were divinely inspired. But again, if this is the um, vehicle that, that we're going to let this operate in, then they mm. were going to use that vehicle to operate. Yeah. I, I know a lot of anthropologists when they kind of talk about channeling in other cultures, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, nobody would look at the West in this way. It's always got to be, quote unquote, other cultures. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, uh, that, that, that the women channels so that, as a way uh, of, uh, of being able to speak. Right, because it's not their sure. talking. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly what you're saying. Um, yeah. yeah, it's it's okay if we do it, if we call it channeling. It's not okay if we call right. it preaching. Right. Um, so it would be interesting to see what that would look like if they were given the vehicle to preach, um, yeah. because the you know their their inclination their um, how should I put it their their search for the divine that would have been the same. But, but maybe it would have looked a little differently. Yeah. Well, time flies like an arrow, fruit flies like a banana. We're somehow already near the end. <laughs> um, and I know uh, where, where Bishop Tim and Joanne is, it's, it's actually uh, the, 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 to lift up the curtain. It's Monday morning their time, so they have to start their day soon. So thanks so much for joining us. But we're not going to end quite yet. Home stretch. This is, this is the home, home stretch uh, alert. Uh, Bishop Tim, do you have uh, any follow-up questions, any, any questions that have sort of jumped into your brain from, from these fascinating topics? Nothing huge. I guess I'm curious if there's, I mean, uh, you've both talked about uh, women that you've studied so far. Is there anyone on, on the list, you know, lying ahead that you're kind of keen to get to or you're really curious about just from the early glimmers that you've seen so far? Because a lot of, I guess, we've talked, about, we've talked about some women like Hildegard and Julian and Teresa who are very famous and some women who are less famous. Um, who's, who's ahead in your search? Um, so I've pretty much finished up Catherine of Siena now, um, who was also a boss woman. And um, <laughs> so in her spare time, she kind of reformed the entire Catholic Church and bring, bring the papacy back to Rome. Um, but she also had incredible mystic visions as well. But so awesome to read her. But I'm kind of looking now um, a little bit more contemporary, um, starting to investigate Christina Rossetti, who uh, was a poet and author um, in the 19th century and uh, the reason why I'm starting to look at her is because she writes incredibly beautiful um, poetry um, talking about kind of ecstatic experience and divine union with God. So um, I, I believe she was a Catholic um, so it'll be interesting to investigate her poetry and see how that um, kind of fits in with what we're studying as well. Yeah, wow, that's super interesting. Cool. Yeah. I'm up to my eyeballs in Bernadette Roberts right now. Um, I, I really <laughs> that's think... a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm currently on my third book of her right now, and I cannot get enough. I can't even think past her right now. So if anybody wants to read Bernadette Roberts, please read Bernadette Roberts. It, what, are the, what are the books you've read so far? I've read The Experience of No Self, The Path to No Self, and right now I'm reading The Real Christ. And... Um, Oof. It just, she's so good. Uh, I will, I will give her one pitch. Um, you know, when in her experience to know self, she talks about the, her experience of that as as just being a mature adult. So for her, it's not even an, an inspired mystical experience. It's just people are supposed to mature into this experience, and that we can, um, you know, experience God at that level um, without our egos being in the way 
or without ourselves being in the way. And that's just how it how it's supposed to be. And, and her um, simplicity around that while being incredibly complex, uh, I, I can't get enough of her. So yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, wow. a, I'm, so I'm a the, fan. It's the, no self is the beginning of life, not some some elevated state that's meant to be experienced towards the end, right? No, no. It, like she really just thinks we're all supposed to get there. So hurry up. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> like, without, without, without hurrying it, you know, she, she respects the fact that it takes a, that there's um, a lot of adjustment. So you have these experiences and then you have to adjust to them. And she makes room for, for that process and talks about it a lot. And she, she actually faults the saints as to hiding it too much. Mm -hmm. um, she's like, I'm sure they went through it, but they hit it so much. So I'm going to speak of it and hopefully other people will speak of it. Um, so I feel a lot of inspiration um, from her. Right. Um, do you folks, I, I know that we don't have uh, a lot of early Gnostic writings. Uh, we don't know a lot of figures from early Gnosticism. We have a handful of names, of course, right? Uh, the Val Valentinus, maybe we have one thing that he wrote. <laughs> um, but specifically Gnostic, because I know there's people screaming at their phones or their computers being like, <laughs> ah, it's talk Gnosis. I, I don't want just mysticism. I want that hardcore Gnostic stuff. So for, for something that's sort of recognizably like Cathar, Gnostic, uh, ancient, modern, 1900s, any sort of female figures, saints, mystics that, that, that we can put the, the big G on that, that you folks are interested in or have been reading or engaging with? I have not found them, but <laughs> if, if people write in and complain and tell us, then we would love to add them to our list. So yep. if you know of someone that, that has the big G, that we haven't stumbled across yet, please let us know. Because, send names, um, send names. <laughs> yes, please. And, and if there's people that don't have the big G that, that your listeners are inspired by, um, again, please send them to us because we, we want to spend time with them. Amazing. Can I, can I offer just a, a little thought? I mean, um, the Magdalene. Mm -hmm. Mary it's Magdalene. It's kind of a big deal. Yeah, and the Gospel of Mary is, is unambiguously a Gnostic text. Um, to me, at least, like it, it sits next to the, uh, it sits next to Sethian tradition. I think as a, as a liberation text. Um, yeah. So, th I'd say that. <laughs> if, you, if, you don't, if you're not considering Mary Magdalene as classically Gnostic, there's something wrong with your Gnosticism. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's true. Stuff. It's in my library. I just haven't spent time with it. So, thank you. No, that's okay. Um, just quickly to add with that, sorry, Tim, as well, is the, the reason why we're investigating all these women too is to potentially um, have them put onto the AJC liturgical calendar as well. So in order for that to be a thing, we do have to find connections with these women um, either within Gnosticism more broadly or um, an affiliation with the Joanite tradition. So as a quick example, um, St. Catherine of Siena, obviously, very, very Catholic, so not Gnostic at all, but her connection to the Joanite tradition was that when she was about five or six years old, her first ever mystical experience and vision was of uh, Christ seated in glory with the apostles Peter, Paul and John. So she's directly connected to the Joanite tradition that way. Um, so that's kind of the work we're doing as well when we're investigating these women um, is to see can they relate to the tradition that we're all currently in as well. Um, and some are a big tick yes, and some are like a whoa, no. So it's not to, <laughs> like Angie can speak to that point as well. But it's, um, yeah, so uh, it's investigating a wide range of women, seeing and how, how they're applicable to um, the AJC calendar as well. Yeah. I, uh, I suspect, uh, I'm going to assume, uh, unless Deacon Angie is, is a good Canadian, unlike me, that <laughs> probably none, no one in the group speaks French in our French Gnostic Church. I um, do not, but I'm making my children learn it, so. Yes, which is exactly what I'm going to do as well. <laughs> um, and I wish my parents had, <laughs> had forced me at gunpoint. Um, but, uh, you know, I suspect because, you know, in, in the Church of Wanao and in the, the Gnostic Revival of the 1800s, women were bishops, right? They were Sophias. Um, so I, I suspect, I bet you there's some cool writing and cool some. figures but it's sort of cut off by the language barrier for us but uh, I'll, I'll do some investigating and send some over um the martinism as well which is you know a gnostic -y french tradition but also accepted women from uh had women leaders and women members from from day one so we've got one um 
sort of from the late 1600s jane lead was one of the oh, of um, course. one of the early rosicrucians uh, she, we've got her on the list as someone to look at at some point so again yes. kind of gnostic adjacent i guess yeah for sure I, oh, go ahead before you wrap up john i do, um i just want to just personally because i'm a member of this group as well the kind of you know full full disclosure of conflict of interest um I'm finding it so valuable to be in a group of women looking at women because it's um, two dimensions to it. One is it's really great to have um, these folks' eyes on these texts because they because Joanne and Angie and Jen are, are kind of seeing commonalities between what these mystics are writing and, and their own experience and the, the parallels between that time and this time in a way that it's harder for me to see. I, I kind of get it once they point it out to me, but it's that's really valuable and, and been really rich for me. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a sense that this is like investigating what, you know, we've, there's, a, there's a lot of work put into investigating what male mystics have said over the years. And that's a lot of what we find on most churches liturgical calendars to kind of start to put some more emphasis on what what women have been saying are around mystical experience over the last couple of thousand years. I, f I feel like it's, it feels like we're kind of rounding out how human experience is. Um, there's aspects of myself that are more vivid, more vividly presented through these, through these works than they are through some of the other mystics that I've read. So yeah, just the kind of, I'm, by the way, backing up, I, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, well, the, thanks for sharing it. And, and again, I've had similar experiences both talking to the women mystics in my life and in engaging with with the work of, of historical women uh, mystics. So, um, Deacon Angie, Joanne, thanks so much. So, uh, I do want to clarify: uh, this isn't just uh, an internal AJC thing. You you have asked people to email you with suggestions and ideas, and and I, I believe you do have a website, right, uh, where people can ch check out some of some of the work you're doing. And I'll put it up here on the screen, and I'll say it for the podcast version. So it's sites.google.com slash angelfire slash yahoo slash dot 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 front slash female slash mystic slash study. No, actually it's sites.google.com slash view slash female mystic study. Uh, I'm going to put it also in the podcast uh, notes. So uh, if you are listening to this as a podcast, please just scroll down on the notes and you'll be able to, to click it there. And uh, if you're listening to the show, you're going to love this site and you're going to love this project. So um before I go, any other plugs? Anybody got anything? I know I already asked. Okay, that means uh, stick around for the last 20 minutes while I do my plugs. Mileandmeditation.substack.com. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know if you're listening to this, I slur my words and I mutter, so that's mile, like the word mile, and meditation.substack.com. You know, like the uh, pulp song. Uh, you, uh, I do free open meditation, secular meditation every Sunday morning. It's not explicitly religious, uh, and it's uh, good for both beginners and for those who have a regular practice. Obviously, if you are a Gnostic, or a mystic or contemplative, you'll get a lot out of it. But if none of that's your jam, you'll also like it. So it's free. Uh, feel free to, to check it out anytime. Uh, Holygrail.substack.com. That's my parish in Montreal. We normally, uh, unlike the meditation, which will always be online forever, uh, this is temporarily online for the crisis. It will go back to being in person. But while it's online, hey, if you want to come and check it out, it'll be great. Uh, it's every second Sunday. It, it too, is, is usually more of a meditation group, especially you know because we're online and um uh, i'm not uh, uh celebrating like the, the the deacon's version of our, of our of our mass or anything so it's more meditation discussion uh but uh feel free to, to stick your head into that uh while it's online okay thanks so much about, uh this was well, we should pub publish con um publish oh, con conclave oh thank you okay i have it here for all those watching <laughs> fired up ready to go locked and loaded thank you for reminding me bishop uh joeandite.org slash conclave folks this is a once in a lifetime or actually hopefully once in a lifetime <laughs> opportunity <laughs> because our annual uh mix of a conference and retreat is normally in person it moves around from city to city sometimes continent to continent and country to country to different hac communities and it is uh just an awesome time i've been to so many of them 
<laughs> so so many now over the last decade, and uh, everyone's been amazing. But now it's online because of the crisis. Uh, I'm not sure when this is coming out, but it will be very soon to when you're listening to this episode. So go to chowanite.org slash conclave. Uh, I, I'm speaking. Uh, Deacon Angie, are you speaking? Hi. Bishop Tim, you're speaking. Joanne, if you're not speaking, you're going to be there mixing. So it's uh, it's going to be a it's going to be a great time. All the stars will be there, folks. You you really you really should check it out. It really is uh, a great time, and you're going to get a lot out of it. And just a fantastic slate of speakers. And uh, uh, every, every conclave is themed, although you know that theme is sometimes a little loose. Uh, for instance, I'm doing something on some medieval texts, but it is modern Gnosticism uh, is, is the theme this year. Modern esotericism. I, I think it's going to be really fascinating, and I think people are really going to really going to love it, even though it is online. So definitely, definitely go to it org slash conclave uh, and uh, register there. Okay. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.